Hey, teenagers, all of you, middle school, high school, Keller campus, West Fort Worth campus, North Richland Hills campus, Pastor Rick here. Uh, if you don't know, uh, I have been the pastor of this church for about 33 years, which means I'm a whole lot older than you are, okay? But I want you to know I love you guys. I love everything you bring to our church, and I love your student pastors. I am pumped about the high school retreat this weekend. I, I really hope you're making it a priority. If you haven't made up your mind yet, listen, I'm praying right now that you will decide to go. I think it's going to be amazing. In fact, I, I would like to start this time with a prayer, if you don't mind. I'd like to pray for the retreat this weekend. Would everybody have with me? Okay. So, Father, thank you so much that we have this opportunity this weekend for uh, so many of these teenagers to draw closer to you and to each other. Here's my prayer. First, God, they'll have a powerful encounter with Jesus, that they'll return more in love with Jesus. I also pray, Father, for some breakthrough, that there are some students that are just carrying some stuff in their lives that are keeping them from the kind of flourishing you want them to have. So I pray for a breakthrough. And I pray against Satan and in anything he would do to try to take away from what could happen this weekend. So Father, move powerfully. I, I really do believe that futures are going to be changed Friday through Sunday. So show up, God, and do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm pumped about that, and I look forward to hearing some great stories. So uh, this past Sunday, I started a series called Soulful. But I want you to know, I started the preaching on Sunday. I started wrestling with the things I was going to say probably three years ago. During the pandemic, uh, I began to wonder, Yes, this is hard, but but why are people on the verge of total breakdown? Why are they so easily angered? And where has all the joy gone? Uh, I had the opportunity back in October to speak to a room full of CEOs of some of the major businesses in America, some of the most powerful men and women in the marketplace. And I asked a question, are your souls tired? And I'm telling you, the whole room leaned in. I mean, to the point of tears. People just seem to be so tired right now. And it's been a burden for me. As, as I shepherd this flock, I want people to be healthy. I want, I want there to be joy in the midst of the pain. And so uh, I thought, what's going on? that our souls seem to be so empty right now. I got convicted by a prayer in the book of 3 John. Uh, John prayed for a friend of his. He said, dear friend, he said, I pray that it's well with your health and everything else in your life, even as it is well with your soul. And it hit me. So many people in my church would not want me to pray that prayer for them. They would not want me to pray. I hope everything else in your life is doing as good as your soul. So um, be honest for just a moment. Would you want uh, Jackson or Manny or Adam or Alexandra or any of your close friends to pray that prayer over you right now? Man, I just hope everything else in my life is doing as good as my soul. Okay, let's stop a second. What do I mean by so? Okay, so you're created in the image of God, every one of you. Every one of you has value because you reflect God. And God created you with a body and a soul, and they both matter. You're not just a body, and you're not just a soul. And Jesus came to save you, body and soul. Now, the Bible says when we die, we immediately go. Our soul immediately goes to be with Jesus. Our body is going to get resurrected when he returns, and body and soul are going to be back together, and Jesus is going to save all of it. But here's what you want to know about the soul. That soul in you is that part of you that most intimately connects to God. God made you in a way that only he can fill you. And we call that your soul. Uh, in the psalm, for example, uh, Psalm 42, verse 2, uh, my soul thirsts for the living God. Where can I go and be with God? There's something deep inside you that is hungry for only what God can fill. Or another psalm says, uh, 
praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. So there's something deep within you that is the real you. That is who you were made by God to be. That connects to God. It's called your soul. And this is why Satan, the devil, the enemy, is always trying to make war against your soul. Because he doesn't want you connecting to God. And boy, it just seems to me there's like a, a lot of evidence out there. Our souls are not doing very good, okay? Uh, the rising uh, use of alcohol and opioids and drugs. Uh, the, the constant errance of grievance and outrage on the internet. The, the skyrocketing rates of depression and anxiety, especially among teenagers. And I don't say that as an indictment. I say that as a pastor that loves you. It grieves me. You didn't ask for it. You did not create the world you're born into. But you're born into a world where teenagers are dealing with struggles with mental health like no generation of teenagers ever on record. There is a war against your soul. Now, I've got some good news. Uh, Jesus knows it's hard for the soul to stay well. He knows that. Uh, maybe the most beautiful invitation ever given, Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary. Anybody feel weary right now? <laughs> Am I talking to anybody that feels kind of tired? He says, come to me, all you that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. That's what Jesus wants to give us. Uh, here's what I've learned. If you have a rested soul, you can handle almost anything else. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, last Sunday, you know what the, the HarperCollins Dictionary Word of the Year was for 2022? Permacrisis. It means it seems like these days we always live with something to be worried about. Uh, just think about the last three years. Pandemic, uh, climate change, uh, political instability, uh, racial strife, uh, inflation. Uh, it, there, there's always something going on. And so the idea, well, I'm just in a tough season right now, and once I get past that season, I won't feel like I'm feeling... You know what? We're never going to get past a season. But when your soul is well, when your soul is healthy, no matter what else is going on outside you, there's something inside you that stays strong and resilient, and the enemy can't rob you of your joy. And that's what I want for my church. Uh, I, I'm not praying, God, please give us easy lives. I'm praying, God, please give us rested, strong, resilient souls so that we can live life well and flourish no matter what's going on out there. And that's what Jesus is offering. Come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. You know, Jesus had an incredibly rested soul. You ever notice that about Jesus? Jesus never seemed stressed out. <laughs> Jesus never said to anybody, you know what, I, got, I don't have time right now to hear what's wrong with your life because I'm just so fried. I need some time for me. I need some me time. <laughs> Jesus always had this incredibly resilient, rested soul. You say, well, that's because he's God. Well, the Bible says he was fully man. He was tempted in every way just like we are. And here's what I'm suggesting is that Jesus lived his life in such a way that took care of his soul, okay? In fact, the statement that I'd like you to remember is you can't have the life of Jesus if you won't choose the lifestyle of Jesus. That Jesus made it a priority to take care of his soul. And, and so here's the big question I want to ask you tonight. Um, are you willing to do what it takes to take care of your soul? Okay? It's not going to happen accidentally. Nobody is going to drift into a healthy soul. 
Are you willing to do what it takes uh, to take care of your soul? That, that most important part of you that keeps you connected to God. So uh, I've been thinking and reading a lot these last number of months. Well, what kinds of things did Jesus do to take care of it? So I'm going to talk about some of those things the next several weeks. Uh, uh, things like, for example, the power of beauty. God just created such a beautiful world. It's full of wonder, and we miss it, and it hurts our souls. Uh, the power of community. Just, just being grounded in the gospel. There are a lot of things that are good for our soul. But this last Sunday, I shared three things that are simple, that will bless your soul. Now, did I say they were easy? I didn't say they were easy. I said they were simple. Three things that Jesus did that were part of his life that took care of his soul. Here's one thing I mentioned, sleep. Jesus took sleep seriously. If his body was tired, he rested. One time, he was on a boat. He was tired in the middle of a storm. He went to sleep. You know, uh, before there was light switches, do you know the average person slept about 11 hours a day? Think about it. You're out there in the middle of nowhere. There's no light. The candles are expensive. It gets dark at 6 o'clock. You go to bed. You don't get up until the sun comes up. People slept, and it was normal. Now, we have light switches now, and we don't just have the late show. We have the late, late show, right? And yeah, I know I'm probably not sleeping enough, but I'll just get an espresso. Or That's why God created Red Bull, right? And we've, we've taught ourselves that we don't have to take care of our body. But remember what I said? You're a body and a soul. And when you don't take care of your soul, it's going to show up in your body. And if you abuse your body, it's going to show up in your soul. Uh, just 30 to 40 years ago, the average person in our country slept about eight hours. It's already down in just one generation to under seven. And my guess is, for some of you, seven hours is more than you're sleeping. Okay, now you may not like what I'm saying, but, but you know what? You were made in God's image. He designed your body and soul to function. And if you don't give your body rest, your soul is not going to be at rest. So let me just encourage all of you to think about the power and importance of sleep. Now, if that one was a little, like I said, they're simple. I didn't say they were easy. So if that one sounds a little hard, the next one's going to sound harder. Silence. Jesus intentionally pursued silence. There's a bunch of verses in the Gospels where it said, and Jesus would go off to a solitary place where he would rest and recover and be with God. Um, in Mark 6, Jesus and his disciples out on a mission trip, and they come back, and he said, um, come with me to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus was at home with quiet. Um, we are not. Again, it's not your fault. You were born into this world. You were born into a world that says, why should you ever have to live with silence? No matter where you are, we got these awesome things called iPods, and you can always have noise. And by the way, sometimes people ask me and say, you talk a lot about you heard from God. How do you hear from God? I never hear from God. One reason you never hear from God is because you got too much noise in your life to hear from God. It's not because God doesn't talk. It's because you're listening to something else. And part of the problem, and you're not going to like me for bringing this up, but these things right here. You know, I'm old enough, I can remember that you did life without these things. I can remember where you did not have to know what was going on in the world every second to be a healthy person. I can remember where you could have lunch with somebody and go one hour without hearing from anybody else, and the world kept turning. You haven't been raised in that world. You've been raised in a world where constant noise is normal. You've been raised in a world where someone should be able to get a hold of you 24-7 and there's some blessings to being connected this way. But oh my goodness, I, I really wonder what it's doing to our soul. You know, 
I say again, your generation of teenagers has the highest rate of anxiety of any generation on record. And they've studied when it started skyrocketing. And teenage anxiety started going off the chart in the year 2007. Does anyone know what happened in 2007? Somebody released the iPhone. You cannot imagine doing life without these things. I get it. Again, you didn't ask for this world. You were born into this world. And I'm not saying you should throw away your iPhone. I'm asking the question, can you really love anybody if you never make margin in your life to be with them and listen to them? Because that's what we're doing with God. We're telling people how much we love God and we create no margin in our life to be quiet and still and listen to God. And I think our souls suffer. So think about that. What does that look like for you? Uh, to get more sleep, to not be afraid of silence, to invite God to come into the silence and be with you. And the last thing is Sabbath. Um, uh, you may not know what that word means. Uh, it, it means rest. It means cessation from work. Uh, the Jewish people were famous. They still are. For every seventh day, they cease from work. In fact, the rabbis say that the Sabbath has kept the Jews better than the Jews have kept the Sabbath. And, and I, I don't want to be legalistic here, but I'm going to argue Sabbath or a day of rest was built into God's creation. Go back and read the very first chapter of the Bible. It's interesting, every ancient civilization had a creation story. But the Genesis 1 story is so different for lots of reasons. I'll give you just two. It's the only creation story where men and women were created equally with value and worth in the image of God. No other creation story treats women equal. And the other thing about the Genesis creation story, all the other stories, humans were created by the gods to work and slave for the gods. In the Genesis story, God creates humans to love and commune with, and he intentionally gives them rest as a gift. In fact, think about it. It says that Adam was created on the sixth day. So what was his first full day, the seventh day? Adam's first full day. You know what his job was? His first full day rest and be with God. And that's how we're made. We were made for this. It, it's God built it into creation. And I like to say, if you, could, if you can rub against the grain in creation, but don't fuss when you get splinters. This is how God built the world. Uh, when, when the children of Israel come out of Egyptian bondage in Exodus, he says, honor that Sabbath. And he grounds it in creation. God built the world to work and rest, to rest and work. That's how he built creation. Now, in Deuteronomy, Moses says, again, honor the Sabbath. This time, he doesn't ground it in creation. He grounds it in liberation. You were once slaves. And here's the big idea. The world and the taskmaster always wants to say your value depends on how much you produce. And the same thing's happening in the world today. Just check out Facebook. Who has value? The people that produce. Look at me. Look what I did. God says that's not where your value comes from. Your value comes from being mine. And Sabbath reminds us of that. How did Jesus spend Sabbath? Well, one thing it says every week. He went publicly to a synagogue with other believers and he worshiped God. That was part of his rhythm. And, and the other thing he did, he, Jesus rested. A Sabbath is um, God saying, I've got the world. You can take a nap. It'll all be okay when you're through. Now, I don't want to be legalistic. I, I realize most of us don't live in a culture where I could just take a, a full day and say, I'm not going to understand that. But every one of us could figure out how can I in my life make sure I'm taking care of myself, that I'm stopping, that I'm resting, that I'm doing what fills me up, that takes care of my soul and keeps me connected 
to God. You really don't have to constantly go all the time. In fact, you really can't. It, your body and your soul will suffer. So I know in your groups, you can talk a lot more about that. And maybe if you get a chance, if you can hear my sermon this Sunday. Uh, when you get back from the retreat, it'll be on the podcast. I'm going to talk a lot more about Sabbath. Here's what I know. Uh, Sabbath is coming for you one way or the other. You can follow Sabbath or God will, it says he will make the sheep lie down. Sabbath is coming. Either you get to choose it or it's going to choose you. You know, Jesus asked maybe the most important question that's ever been asked. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his soul? And, and I don't think he's just talking about your eternal destiny. I think he's talking about even right now. And in your life, are you really winning if you're constantly tired, if inside you feel empty, and if you're just going through the motions with not a lot of joy. And if every single news of the next crisis just wipes you out, I don't think that's winning. Jesus said, take my yoke. In other words, um, I will teach you how to do life. I, I will show you a way to do life that's better than you've been doing it. And, and you can live with a rest of self. Well, that, that's my prayer for you. I really, I really, I really mean that. I, I want you to thrive. I want you to flourish. I want you to be a witness to your friends. Not because you walk around holding up a Bible at school or have a John 3, 16 t-shirt, although if you want to wear one, that's cool. I'm, I, I want your friends to come to you and say, man, there's something about you. You just seem to keep it together. And, and they don't know it, but... What's different about you? You have a strong, rested soul. So that's my prayer, uh, that you will be soul full. Know this, Pastor Rick loves you. I'm gonna be praying for you this weekend and this whole next month. And remember, uh, Jesus doesn't want to take away a good life. He wants to give it. Listen and learn from Jesus.